Welcome to Empire Building, the podcast where we talk about big businesses and even bigger lives. I'm your co-host, Bea Williams. And I'm Seychelle Van Poole. And I am so excited today because Via and I have a very special guest for you. We have the one and only Monica Sawyer with us today. And Monica is really unique for a, a host of reasons, but there's a few very special reasons why we have her on the podcast with us today. She not only hosts a, a podcast in her own right called Real Estate Investing for Women, which if you haven't subscribed highly to it, everybody. yes, yep. I highly recommend you go and subscribe right now to that. Um, but she also has a TEDx talk called Who is the Boss of You? And she's written a book that I think really resonates a lot with what our mission is with our podcast here which her book is called Choose Bliss, The Power and Practice of Joy and Contentment. And her multi-million dollar real estate empire is the combination with her lifelong focus of bringing bliss into her life on a daily basis, which I just love. So Monica, welcome. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Oh, ladies, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited about this conversation. Us too. Well, and you know, <laughs> we're so in alignment because I think it's so interesting. Like we focus on building businesses and even bigger lives here on Empire Building mm-hmm. Podcast. And and I, I just, you know, you are so aligned because I look at what you've done. You took like, I don't know, $10,000 and turned it into a $5 million portfolio. And you only work like five to 10 hours a month with a, a fascinating, month. fascinating strategy yeah. that I've never heard of before that I can't wait to dive into. I mean, you've traveled the world. You've been to over 55 countries, which I'm super jealous of because I'm still I in know. the 30s. So like <laughs> I have many, like I'm hearing that and I'm mm-hmm. like, I have a long way to go. But you speak and you teach and you, you've you really done it. Like you're, you've built that life mm-hmm. that, that we talk about a lot. Like you are the living, mm-hmm. breathing example of what we preach. So mm-hmm. I'd love to kind of start with, obviously there's a lot of ways to build wealth, but why real estate? Like what, what made you choose that as your primary vehicle? Mm-hmm. So it's really funny, Via, because I got into real estate kicking and screaming. Like I was a no thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No so way. Anyway, Mom over, did it. Mom did it. That's yeah. right. Over my dead body. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's so true. Like dad says, do this. And you're like, no, thank you. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so, mm-hmm. <laughs> so my, my real estate story started long before I was born. Um, my mom and dad mm. are Indian. They had an arranged marriage in India and moved to the United States as newlyweds, barely knowing each other with $200 in their pocket. And Mm. dad had heard that the golden ticket to wealth in the United States is to buy real estate. And I just want everybody to hear this. Like people know all over the world that if you go to, if you invest in real estate in the United States, it's a way to build wealth. No Mm. other country in the world has the opportunities for real estate that we have here. The government supports us. Our taxes support us. Um, It's an intuitive way that all of us know to do. And yet here as Americans, we kind of take it for granted. We get intimidated, whatever. But people outside of this country know this is how you do it. So my dad had heard this. And so um, they started saving their money and they bought their primary residence. And then I was born. And Once I was born, they were like, you know how new parents are, right? They're like filled with love and joy and passion and this hope for what the future is going to be like, right? So now they start saving all their nickels and dimes. My mom was actually an MD, but they were saving every little dime. So she's like sewing her her cushions for her sofa or or the curtains. You know, she's like every dime she can save so that they can invest in real estate. And eventually when I'm three years old, they buy their very first property. Mm. And then fast forward, they have two more kids. I start going to college and they pay for my college education through their real estate investing. They do the same for my two sisters. They pay for all of our weddings, right? So Mm. they really did it, right? So Mm. that was awesome. When I graduated from college, I graduated in a recession and I could not find a job. And I was scared mm-hmm. out of my mind. For anybody who's watched my TEDx, you know that I'm a very independent woman. Like, I had to be completely self-sufficient. So I was sort of <laughs> like, how am I going to do this adulting thing? I can't make money. Yeah. Like, you know. And I remember one day, and I did not want to do real estate because I'd seen the money and, like, the advantages. 
But I had also seen my dad's stress. I had seen what it had taken away from him. He was Mm -hmm. always stressed about the money and what was going on with the houses and paying the mortgages and his tenants calling. There was always all this stress. And for me, I'm all about bliss. I have been since I was a very young woman. And I was like, real estate is what I understood is it's the long game. You know, you're going to have a relationship with this business for a very long time. I did not want to have a business in my life that was going to cause me that level of stress. Mm. So anyway, so I'm sitting with my dad after I graduated over the kitchen table, and he said something to me that completely changed my life. He said, you know, Monica, everybody has stress, everybody has fear, and everybody has money problems. Do you want poor people money problems, or do you want rich people money problems? Mm. Boom. Boom, yeah. Yeah. Talk about changing your life. My first thing was rich people have money problems. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> right? yeah. They have money. Why do they have problems? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have problems, but there's no problems, right? Yeah. So I decided in that moment that that was the choice that I was going to make. And I was going to go into real estate, but mm. with the focus on bliss. Because for me, like I said, I did not want something in my life that was going to take away from my joy. I wanted to build a business, even if it was real estate, and even if it seemed impossible but I was going to build this business in a way that it supported the joy in my life. So that's kind of how I got started in real estate. So, you know, I it's love- interesting. Um, it's interesting, Monica, because we were, you were talking about your parents use real estate for college. And mm-hmm. I just kind of wanted to point out to all of you guys listening who might be a little older and your kids are getting close to college. I ended up buying my son a house, his going yeah. into his sophomore year in Austin, Texas, and um, it enabled him to gain residency. We will make a profit on college. At the end of the day, because that a house has appreciated so much, and because our costs of college have gone down, by the way, it's costing us a fraction of what it would have costed us to have him in the dorms. Mm-hmm. So by the time that's said and done, should we choose to sell that house when he graduates? We will literally make six figures from him going to college. Talk about an instant ROI. So even if you didn't build that up ahead of time, you might want to look into the state you're moving to. There are tremendous opportunities to use real estate for college, either pre-college or during. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. Thank you so much for that. that. And I've heard that story many, many times, Via. So thank you so much. Well, and and in addition to that, Um, Monico, something that I'm hearing is you don't often find the words bliss and joy and real estate investing in the same sentence. (laughs) And I I love that you not only have married these two together, but you've been incredibly purposeful about like making this your mission in this world. And so I guess I would like to start with the actual word itself, which is the word bliss. What, Mm -hmm. when you think of that word, what does bliss mean to you in your world? What does that look like? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Cause so many people, it's a, it's a word that people have all sorts of ideas about. So Uh for me, (laughs) for me, bliss is a deep sense of joy and contentment and Mm -hmm. the confidence that you can handle anything that comes your way. So when we talk about bliss, from my perspective, we're really talking about emotional resilience and emotional mastery. Mm -hmm. Um, And that you, you have that place, I call that home. That's your emotional home. It doesn't mean that we don't have the whole range of emotions. We need those. We have a right to those. Those teach us things, right? Mm -hmm. But we have the tools and the um, the heart, like that's our priority, that the place that we always come back to, the place we always land is at bliss. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So what I'm not hearing is, is life is perfect and sunny and daffodils Mm -hmm. and roses all the time. What I'm hearing is, is that you have the tools and the grounding intention and intention behind, even when things hit the fan, you know how to handle that situation and then bring it back to joy or bring it back to that grounded contentment as fast as humanly possible. Is that yeah, is that I, a fair understanding of that? Absolutely. And I just want to add one thing because these are all business people. Uh-huh. We as humans, we create the filters that we look through into the world. Like you hear people say, oh, she wears rose-colored glasses. That's actually something that's said about right. me all the time. Right. Well, you're wearing glasses of your creation no matter what. Why not mm. make them rose-colored, right? Because 
in the end, the story that's in your head creates the reality that you live. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and your perception is your reality. Absolutely. That is so true, right? And we make it up anyways, right? Like I tell this story about my husband and I, we're in Iceland. We go on vacation and and people, we came back and people were like, how was the weather? And in the same breath, I was like, oh my God, it was horrible. And he says, oh my God, it was amazing. And people were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it was our pictures because I was cold the whole time, bundled up, freezing. My husband was like, oh my God, it's sunny the whole time. Mm-hmm. And if you like really look at that, he created one story and I created another story with the mm-hmm. same situation. Well, if you're creating stories in your own head about every given circumstance anyways, why not make them good stories? And then once you have those filters of life works and you've got good stories mm-hmm. that have created your filters, now when you go into a challenging situation, you're looking at it through a perspective of life is good. I can solve this. I got this under control right? It's a very different perspective than, oh my God, the world is falling down on me. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. sorry, go ahead. How did you, no, I love this and I want to keep going with this because um, how did you, how did you get to choosing that that is how you want to live your life? Because um, is this something that you were just born with a sunny disposition mm-hmm. and like you just came out that way? Or like, is this something that like you got to at a certain point and decided to choose this because this is mo- most people I find like accidentally slip into this or are born this way. It's not like a decisive choice for them. And I'm hearing a lot of intention behind this for you. Yeah. So my book is called Choose Bliss because it is a choice. Uh-huh. Um, I actually, um, I think that people, I don't know if you've heard this term, um, your mess is your message. You know, Mm -hmm. part of why I focus so much on bliss is because my life was really messy and really not blissful. I had amazing Mm. parents. Thank you, God, right? But Mm -hmm. everything else didn't work. I mean, I was, um, and I hope this isn't offensive, but I was the only non-white person in my schools growing up. And so people hated Mm -hmm. me. I was humiliated. I was treated badly. I was tortured. Mm -hmm. I was like people were horrible to me. And so I learned very young that nobody was going to like me and I was going to be all alone. Well, that's a scary, horrible place for a young child. Right. That's a very scary place. I became a people. Right. And then I became a people pleaser because I want, I didn't want to be alone. I did want to be happy. And then I got into college and, you know, I, I don't even know if I should say it anyways, things, horrible things happen. Boys did horrible things to me because I was a pleaser. I couldn't say no. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so that happened in high school. Then it happened in college. And I, you know, I couldn't, I wanted to be happy. So that was my life mission is I wanted to be happy. And so I was developing tools to, to live that, but hadn't, I mean, obviously this is like your life work, right? You, you're learning over time. Mm -hmm. So when I finally graduated from college, I got a great job. Um, I was moving into a new place. I didn't get a great job. I got a horrible job, but I was moving into a new place. And <laughs> and I got, <laughs> it was horrible. You're like, actually, I it was terrible. It was terrible. No. Yeah. <laughs> I made like this much money. I was like, uh, whatever. <laughs> and, and I moved into this new place and I got in a horrible car accident. They dislocated oh, my hips. They thought I had broken my neck. The doctors mm-hmm. told me I would be paralyzed for life. And the part that you don't know is that my whole life, since I was five, I was a dancer. It was the only thing that Mm. kept joy in my life was this creative outlet of dance. And I wanted to be a professional dancer. And I danced all over the world. Like I had a reputation. You know what I mean? It was like Mm. the thing Mm -hmm. that lit me up. And now my legs have been taken away from me. I couldn't, not only could I not dance, but I couldn't even walk. Wow. And so... I decided they were going to put me in a chair. I decided, no, I was going to walk again. I was going to dance again. Mm-hmm. Like I had to have that. So it was a long journey back to being, being kind of a normal person in between yeah. there. I married a husband because, you know, husbands make everything right. Right. Or <laughs> anybody who heard that understand as wonderful as our spouses are, they cannot fix our lives. They can't fix right? us. No. They can't Mm -hmm. fix our life as much as, and my husband really wanted to, but he couldn't. So I went into a huge depression because 
nothing was working. Mm -hmm. I didn't have my legs. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get a good job. My husband couldn't fix my life. Nothing was working. And I remember I went into a huge depression. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a downward slide for about two years. And one week Mm -hmm. I was laying in bed and I hadn't gotten out of bed. I just cried for a week. And I remember one morning um, I heard my mom's voice in my head and she said, Monica, get out of bed, get some air. You'll feel better. Right. And so I pulled the covers over my head swung my weak legs because I was still very weak, my weak legs Mm -hmm. um, off the bed, tried to get out of bed and my legs were so weak, I fell to the ground and I couldn't move. Mm. And in that moment, I just, um, I just cried and I prayed and I told, I said to God, you know, I can't keep doing this. So please have mercy on me and bring me home or teach me how to live. Mm. And so um, about an hour later, a girlfriend called. I hadn't heard from her in years. I was like, God, I was like, God sent you to me, you know. So she um, called me. She heard me crying and she turned me on to a coach. And that coach Mm. is who I started working with. And he taught me something very interesting. He said, you know, as children, we're born into this world, these little bundles of bliss. We are resilient. We don't have emotional, we don't have the emotional problems. We are masters, right? We feel everything and then we come back to joy, right? We're in complete Mm. awe of the world and we want to learn. We want to walk. We want to experience all of it, right? That's how we're born. And then life teaches us that it's hard and we Mm. lose that bliss that we're born with. And so he says, your birthright is to live a blissful life. And wow. so he want, he 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 knew how much work I had already done there. He uh-huh. he took a different approach to his training of me, and together we brought me back to bliss. Now the thing that I want everybody to hear in this is that it was first a choice. Like I had to choose. I mm. want to live. Yeah. And I had to choose. I was going to call somebody for help. And then when he told me all of these things, I had to choose that that was going to be my path. Because I could have mm-hmm. chosen something different. You absolutely could have. Right. So I made wow. those choices and now the journey begins. Just because I make a choice doesn't mean it's easy. Well, now then the you have to do the begins. work. Yeah, yeah then you have to do the work. work. But you're absolutely right, Monica. Like the first, the first step is the choice, right? And mm-hmm. and we talked we've talked about on the podcast before, like we can't always control what happens to us. And your your situation is such a beautiful example of that. But we can control the attitude that we keep and the actions that we take. And what I'm hearing from you is through a series of really gritty experiences, you finally got to a point where you had to make choices. Mm-hmm. And you then made really hard, difficult choices. And then you had to take action on them. So... Right. This is almost a perfect segue into choosing bliss, and now you have to act on bliss. Right. So how, I'm just so fascinated by this because choosing is one thing, but then to actually do it is something totally different and much harder, I feel Mm -hmm. like. (laughs) Well, you know, and I just want to, I want to actually interject something in there just so that people can hear, is that we are always making choices. Yeah. I mean, I made the choice to get really depressed. That's a truth. I didn't make the choice for the accidents or for the rapes or for any of that stuff. But I did make a choice to hold grudges, be upset, Mm. get depressed, feel like the world was ending. I made all of those choices. So every moment of every day, we are making choices. The thing is, are you making choices that serve your joy or that serve mm. your pain, right? And mm. so it was a choice the whole way, how I responded, right? We can't control what's outside of us, but we must control what's inside of us. And I was You know, it's interesting that. to me that, mm. yeah, and that you, that your definition of bliss, I'm fascinated by the fact that it, it has a, an emotional regulation component to it, because I agree with that. Emotional mm-hmm. regulation has been probably one of the, t- the highest impact changes I've made in my life to make my life better. Mm-hmm. 
And I don't hear it a lot. You know, I, I wouldn't hear, I don't think it's it's a typical definition to hear somebody say bliss is effectively emotional regulation. I, I agree with you, by the way. Mm-hmm. I think it is. Mm-hmm. But where did you get that? That I, I know we need to move on to real estate, but I really do want to know where did yeah. that link come? That came. When from did my, you discover? We, you're like, yeah. That came from my coach. So, so I had read about it a lot. Like I had read, you know, the power of positive thinking. I had read Think and Grow Rich. I had read um, the power of, of uh, making and influencing friends. What is that Mm -hmm. by Dale Carnegie? You know what I mean? How to win friends Uh, and influence people. That's right. (laughs) Influence people. So I had read the big guys. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Um, And so I knew that mindset was a big deal, but I think, yeah. you know, when you're younger, you don't understand. You're sort of like, oh yeah, I get that. I've got a good mindset. And, a lo- mm-hmm. you know, a lot of us adults, oh, I'm a really positive person. And then all they do is like mm-hmm. complain, right? You're like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so, <laughs> so I well, read all that stuff, but it hadn't but landed. Then, like, well, and but life also hadn't served you up yet. That's right. Like sometimes life just serves you some. Yeah. Decent hardships. Yeah. Where you're just like, yeah. oh, that one, that one hurt. That was a smack. Yeah. Oh, and that one also was a smack. And then you get a couple in a row. And 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 I I don't think anyone would place blame on you or or I tell you you're wrong and that it's sometimes okay to feel the way you feel. Oh my and gosh. And I think it's important. It is important to process through that. Yeah. And I think that it's also rational that you might feel some depression in, in that experience um, because your life was at, I mean, at a pivotal point of potentially completely changing what you knew. Um, And I applaud you for finding a coach that could meet you where you were at. And I think we all at pivotal points in our life need a coach or a great therapist or a psychologist um, that can help us see the things that we can't see to help us get to the places that we don't feel like we can go right. without having or a guide with us. And you did. we need to go. Yes. Right? Like sometimes yes. we don't even know. Like mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I'm a positive person. Everybody's like, oh, Monica, you're mm-hmm. always smiling. It's not that you're always mm. smiling. That doesn't make you positive. What makes yeah. you positive is what's actually going on in your head. You know, and my coach really showed me my my blind spots. Mm -hmm. And that's really via, that's how it became a priority because I realized that I had all the information, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't implementing. Going back to Mm -hmm. Seychelles um, comment about, so how do you actually make it happen? Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just work with so many people and I'm exposed to so many people who let their emotions completely rule their lives. I watch mm-hmm. them make decisions just uh, sheerly based on emotion and, and just, um, you know, I, it's, it's hard. It, I did it. I mean, I, I, it, to my own degree and, and it's, I think as a leader and a coach and a boss and, you know, all the things we are, a mom, um, it's, um, it's, it's, as I, as I get more older and more evolved, that is the one thing. Emotional regulation is probably the most important thing that humans can master. If not, you know, mm-hmm. it's gotta be top three. Yeah. And it's not talked about agree. enough. And so I, 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 I did not expect to hear that in a definition mm. of bliss. And, and I, I couldn't agree more about it. So mm-hmm. thank you. Anyway, mm-hmm. let's, so, let's, let's move on from bliss yeah. into life and to bliss into investment in real estate. Yeah. So how do you then pair that with being very purposeful about how you build those choices? You're right, because it is a choice. Um, how did, how did you build out your framework for what that looks like then when you started investing into real estate? Yeah. So there are some things that Ted told me, and then I took it a few steps deeper, but the very first thing that Ted asked me was, who are you? And I, and you Mm -hmm. like, like, who am I? I'm Onika. Like what? (laughs) Right. I'm awesome. What else do you need to know? No, exactly. (laughs) But, um, (laughs) but his thing was, do you even know what's important to you? Like Mm -hmm. I knew that I was supposed to have this job. I was supposed to do all these things, but a lot of that was laid out by my parents and my parents are awesome people. But was that mine? Like were those Mm -hmm. values mine? And so for him, his first thing was, and, and this is so funny because this happened over and over again as a coach when I became a coach. 
he said, so what are your core values? Well, it's family, God, you know, but, you know, we all have our pat answer about what our values are. But, you know, each of those values could be torn, um, delved deeper into so that you find what they really, what is it that really makes you tick? And the, the thing that you learn is if you're living by your core values or if you're not living by your core values, mm -hmm. you feel this sort of like split. People say, you know, I compartmentalize stuff. I'm this person here and I'm this person here and I'm this person mm -hmm. there. We do that to our values mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I have my my business values. I have my personal values. I have my values with my children. Like we're split. But the problem is that mm. you don't ever feel like a whole person. Yeah. And so you make choices that then when you're acting in that way, you feel like a fraud. You're not mm -hmm. happy. You wake up one morning, you're like, why do I hate my life? Right? So the very first place is to find out what your values are. So mm -hmm. that's the first place. Yep. And then um, the next place is your why. Why is living bliss or living those values important to you? What is it that you're wanting in life? So we have our goals, our financial goals, our business goals, right? But we also have personal goals. Happiness to me was a high priority. Mm -hmm. And and, and I, people will often say, well, my highest priority is that my kids get you know, food, right? Food, mm -hmm. education, mm -hmm. house, you know, that sort of thing, right? Why? If you really think about that, why is that important to you? Because it brings you peace. It brings you joy. Mm -hmm. The very end mm -hmm. result that we are all searching for is that feeling of bliss deep down inside. So why not start with that? You start with bliss as the final goal. And then you position and align everything that you do in life to meet that final goal every step of the way. And I will tell you mm. that it's really, really hard because uh, most people don't live by their values. No. And mm -hmm. so you're not going to get a lot of support in that because you start having to say no a lot. Mm -hmm. It's hard. People don't understand. You, sometimes you don't understand. Like, how, why is this so hard? <laughs> right? Yeah. Eventually, yeah. though, people start to understand, oh, this is just who this person is. Like, she lives this way and she's consistent. Like, these are the things that I know I can count on when I talk to Monica because I'm very, very consistent because I'm living by the truth of who I am. So your your core values are really important and your your why is really, really important. And then the next piece in designing a life that's blissful is understanding your resources. So in real estate, that sounds really easy, right? How much money do I have? How much time do I have? And we're talking about time as in, do I have 20 years or one year to reach my goal? How much time each week do I want to spend? So there's all of those things, right? But the things that we don't talk about is your resources in your business, but also in your personal life. What is mm. your risk tolerance? How much time do you want to sleep at night? When is your good biological work cycle? Right? Who are, is it that you're spending time with and who do you want in your life? For me, my, my real estate business is built so much around my tenants because they're, I consider them my business partners. It's important to me that I have good tenants, good relationships, right? Relationships are a big deal to me in everything with my parents, with my family, with everybody, with my friends. My tolerance. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? You made a comment that I think a lot of um, people that own rental properties would find interesting, which is you said, my tenants are my business partners. Can mm -hmm. you unpack that a little bit for me? And then mm -hmm. we can move forward to the next thing you were going to say. But I just, I caught that and it's something we've talked about with you before, but I think it's really uh, different than how most investors view their tenants. Yeah. What, is, actually, what does that mean I'm to done you? with that. Yeah, okay. we can. Um, so, but so our, our, for me, relationships are a big resource, my, yeah. my feeling about relationships. And so, so just knowing your resources. So with my tenants, one of my resources is I don't want to spend, I don't want to spend a lot of time in my business. I'm going to spend a lot more time playing, <laughs> right? That's a big yeah. priority yeah. for me. And so my tenants who are going to be living in my houses are going to be either taking care of the houses or calling me with every issue that comes up, right? Yeah. So what I wanted, at, what, the way that I was going to design my business is that there were a couple of things. 
My tenants are my business partners because they're going to determine how much time I spend in the business and how much joy I experience in the business. Mm -hmm. My dad, for instance, got calls for everything. Light bulbs were out. Um, Toilets were clogged up, right? All of Mm -hmm. those things that happened, he was getting called for. For me, I did not want to get called for those things. My, what I'm providing is a beautiful home and complete autonomy. So the, the, Mm renters needed to be good with, I manage the home in a way that I feel joy in my house. I don't have a landlord breathing down my neck. I don't have to wait on someone else's schedule to get things fixed, right? So, but I would train them at the very beginning. But when I chose a tenant, it had to be a person that I knew was interested in living in my home in that way, right? So that's why I say they're my business partners. They're they're taking care of the house, Right. Mm -hmm. I'm providing the house. Right. But together we're building my business and we're building their life. Right. So it's not just all about me. I'm there for them, too. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by they're my business partners, because they're the ones that really build my business. It's really all about them. Truly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A a happy tenant eliminates a lot of issues. And I love that you are very specific about the person you're looking for then, because then you're going to view your tenant criteria totally differently. Absolutely. Um, how do you, so Via and I both own rental properties ourselves. And I find often the first six months a tenant is in the home. They're the most, I call it squeaky. It's like, eh, mm-hmm. this doesn't work. Eh, I'm learning about this. Mm-hmm. Eh, this isn't quite right yet. And then they get six months in and they settle into the property and they get more mm-hmm. comfortable. And so when, like in my experience, having a longer term tenant um, and it's happy in the home, right? Means that actually I deal with a lot fewer issues in the long run. I'm curious about how how that looks for you. If that, you know, I know other people that want to raise rent as much as possible, and then that generates more cash flow. It also generates more turnover sometimes. Like, I'm curious, how do you juggle that balance? And sort of, what does that look like in your world on your side? Mm-hmm. So I, most of my tenants, I have the same experience that they're kind of the squeaky wheel when they first move in. And so I use that as a training opportunity. So we'll have the conversation even before they move in, that these are my expectations. I'm not going to be the super active landlord that's doing everything for you. You're also not going to have to wait on my schedule, right? Mm. So there's a benefit Mm -hmm. to both of, both of us. However, in those first three months about is what it works out when they're, they're, when they're having the squeaky wheel mm-hmm. syndrome. <laughs> mm-hmm. Those are mm-hmm. the moments where I'm like, okay, so this is how I would ask you to deal with this in the future. And we go through a training period, right? And I'll help mm-hmm. them. I'll, I'll watch them make decisions and tell them how I might adjust that decision. But after about three months, anything that comes up, they'll call me and say, some of them will call and say, do you want me to handle this or do you want to handle it? And I'm always like, mm-hmm. you handle it. You, know, you handle always. it. Yeah. Some, yeah. Sometimes I handle it, but mm-hmm. um, usually it's you handle it. it. But they already know how. And many of them never even call. They never ask that question. They say, the water heater went out. I called three plumbers. These are the quotes that I got. Can I get it fixed? They have an availability tomorrow. Sure. Send me Great. the bill. Yeah. Take it out of your rent. It's done. Right? Um, mm-hmm. So so there's a training period that goes on during the squeaky wheel t- period. Right? And then after that, um, they're happy. Now they're living in their home. So rents, my husband and I very much disagree with this, on this. Okay. <laughs> he hey, that's wants a healthy me, marriage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he wants me to raise rent every 5% every single solitary year. Mm-hmm. I will tell, so there are some of my tenants, uh, every single tenant I will say, you can expend a raise, expect a raise in rent every year. I can do it or you can choose. And so what that means is you take a look at Zillow when you're co- when we're at a year and you take a look at what your rent should be and then bring bring me a conversation. Right? Let's negotiate what happens next. Pretty consistently renters so I do have renters that give me a raise every single year without me ever asking. That's amazing. But it's not typical. Most of them are like, "Well, you know, rents are about the same. Can we keep it the same?" <laughs> That yeah. sounds about right. And, yeah. Right. And the the truth is, if they're a good tenant, yeah, a lot of times I will keep it the same or mm-hmm. just a little bit higher. Like I might raise it $50 or something. Mm-hmm. The bad side on that is that I fall way behind on my rents. 
my, you yeah. know, and at some On point your I have percentages. to say, right. that's right. That's right. Like, you know, rents, market rent is a thousand dollars more than what they're paying. That's off by a lot. And I'll usually catch it by then. At some point you have to raise the rents, but I do prefer to have long-term tenants. My tenants stay 10 to 12 years. And then mm-hmm. I'm not dealing with the 10, 15, $20,000 that it takes for a turnover. That's right. Right. Yeah. So if you well, raise I mean, and rent, you're teaching them to self-manage is what you're doing. Right. It's brilliant. Right. Yeah. Which yeah. is so brilliant. Yeah. It's yeah. I've never, I've never seen anybody do it this way. It's so smart. So smart. And it feels really good for everybody involved. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, it's really Monica, blissful. what does your portfolio look like right now? So, so I have um, a construction project that I'm about to, to refinance and, and uh, probably rent out. So we'll have two more doors by the end of this year. I have mm-hmm. three executive homes. I have two um, more middle-class homes. And then I have five homes that I've sold notes on. Um, what is that? 12 places. I've only got 12 doors. And this is one of the things. Or 12. That's 12. Yep. Something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I am also a big believer. We're going to talk a little bit about building lifestyle. The more yeah. doors you have, to me, the more responsibility you have, especially the, the way that I manage it. There are different ways to manage it. Okay. Mm-hmm. But for me, there's mm-hmm. more responsibility. My sweet spot is at about 10 doors. So what happens there is, um, first of all, I'm, I'm only getting phone calls very rarely. I work five to 10 hours a month, right? Mm-hmm. But when a door, a door becomes vacant, um, it's a big percentage. It's 10% of my portfolio, right? But because yeah. of the yeah. way that I manage them, doors never stay vacant for more than a couple of weeks. So I fill them. So there's a lot less. That's kind of the sweet spot for me. I know that I've got more doors than that. I'm probably going to be working a little bit harder. There's more to manage. But with mm-hmm. 10 doors, I know uh, I'm fine. Rents are going up. Cash flow is increasing. Um, equity is increasing. Loans are going down. It's a very manageable business. And and because I, of the locations that I pick, the appreciation is beautiful. So it's uh, the rents are going up, the appreciation is going up, and I'm happy, and my tenants are happy, and we don't have turnovers. I'm able to keep them very happy, right? I I love that you know thyself as an investor. Mm-hmm. I think that's so important to understand your risk tolerance, to understand what you're looking for. Um, you know, I'm sure listeners are curious, what criteria do you look for? Because you said, you know, I look for areas that have high appreciation. What's kind of your buy box, if you will, um, for when you're looking for an investment property? Yeah. So the buy box starts with the tenant. Who is it that I want to be doing business with? Right. Mm -hmm. And then I Mm -hmm. buy houses that they would want to live in. I do enjoy dealing with different kinds of tenants. So let me tell you the three that I've chosen right now. The first is an executive tenant. They're a person that's very much like me. So there's no us and them. We're partners. I'm not the landowner that they're just a number two. Right. No, Mm -hmm. we are partners. We're equals. We understand the way each other thinks. That's my favorite kind of tenant. And they usually live in homes that I've already owned and lived Mm -hmm. in myself. Got it. The next one is kind of the, um, I hate to say middle class because it doesn't really describe, but the, Mm -hmm. um, the beginning entrepreneur. Every person in these other homes has been the beginning entrepreneur because I was that person. And I love Mm -hmm. that personality type. I love the energy. I love the conversation. You know, I love hanging out with those people. And they're not as super reliable, you think. Like their credit score is not always perfect. Their income is not always perfect. But Mm -hmm. they are very, very conscientious of, I need to be a responsible person because that's Mm -hmm. their their core value. That's how they build Mm -hmm. businesses right? Mm -hmm. And I love those people. So I'm usually giving them a chance. I've only been burned once and that's okay with me, right? So these are people that I'm giving a chance to. So where an executive home might rent for five or 55, 5,000 or 5,500, the, um, the entrepreneurial home will own for, will rent for 3,000 to 3,500. So that's the other price Mm -hmm. range. And then the next one are the people that are not able to buy a home. They might, have a family, think they could never own a home. Mm-hmm. So they're they're struggling a little bit. And so what I'll do is I'll buy a piece of property and then um, sell it on a lease to own. So mm-hmm. now I'm the bank, 
So I make mm-hmm. sure that they have the income. Um, and I always place the rent, and this is one of my strategies for all of my houses, as I place the rent a little bit less than what it should be, according to Zillow. Like I find a range and I'm usually in the middle. I want to provide the best opportunity at a, um, a reasonable price. I don't usually go top of the mm-hmm. market. And when I'm selling these homes, I'll sell it below rent because they're still going to pay property taxes and insurance. But for the price of rent, they now get to own a home, which Mm. uplifts them. And they feel like, oh, I own this. Right. So even though it's not the kind of person that I normally would do business with, my heart Mm. is now taking care of people that that wouldn't normally have that opportunity. So that's more about, that's a more emotional decision that I got into that business, but mm-hmm. it was important to me. For me, giving back is important and I have so much. I'm so grateful. I'm so blessed and I want to give back and I'm in a position that I can do that now. So I want to. So that one's more emotional. The other two are much more business related. Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Makes total sense. I mean, you're really buying your, your acquisitions to your point, I mean, you, you're you're reverse engineering all of this, which I love. Mm-hmm. You're you're saying this is my tenant, so I'm going to buy a product for the tenant, and it's just mm-hmm. so different from how yeah. I, I know that we think about that a lot. Like I know that we think about tenants, like do we want a you know student population or do we want you know this or that, but that is very specific. So I think that's really cool. Mm-hmm. I do too. So Monica, I have one last question for you today, which is, what have we not asked you that we need to make sure we're asking you? So we talked a little bit about designing our life, right? And I mm-hmm. really want to talk about that if we've got a few minutes and sort of what that mm-hmm. looks like. Mm-hmm. People, you know, I'm retirement age now, um, but I haven't always been at retirement age. Um, I've been working in corporate America. My husband and I love to travel. We've been to over 65 countries now, Via. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Just showing us up. Show us up. That's so awesome. <laughs> but I'm, so I'm significantly old. From both of you guys, so whatever. <laughs> Except oh. if you're if you're watching this right now, I need I'm you to know do how a country count again. I need to do a yeah, country count. I just fabulous. got back from a new one. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so when I was designing my life originally, I had 20 years till retirement, mm-hmm. and here were some rules. When I'm on vacation, I'm on vacation. I don't work. I heard one mm-hmm. time in when I was at in Hawaii, some guy said. You know, people want to get away from their work. It's just too bad that they don't love their work enough that they want to take it with them on vacation. But it's clinically mm-hmm. proven that if you don't ever give your mind a rest, you will never perform at your top. You will never have more cre- as much creativity as you could. You will never perform at your very best. You will never, ever settle into just having this blissful, open mind. You need vacations. We need them. But some people don't agree with me, and that's okay. So they want to take, they're okay with taking their work on vacation. So here are some things to really think about. What does bliss look for, like for you? Mm-hmm. When you're creating a lifestyle business, what does that mean to you? For me, it meant when I'm home, I'm work. When I'm on vacation, I don't even, I mean, I do nothing. No work, no computer, nothing, right? And then I come back and I start working again. Now, my husband and I are talking about when we retire, neither one of us is ever going to be able to retire. We will always work. So now what if we want to go for a trip around the world for two years? Right. Mm-hmm. The probability is that we will not be able to not work. We're going to want to. We will get bored. Right. Mm-hmm. And we've had this experience. We traveled for six months around the world. We were for three weeks at this place and three weeks for that place. There were many days where we thought, what if I had a project to work on? right? Maybe we just work Mm. for two hours a day. So now as we're redesigning what our blissful lifestyle life looks like, we understand that we're going to have, if we're in periods for places and long periods of time, we're going to be willing to work for a couple of hours a day. But that Mm -hmm. hasn't been the way that it is in the past. So being really self-aware of who you are, what your priorities are, what bliss looks like, what the lifestyle business, what your lifestyle looks like that you're designing the business around is hugely important because people are always like, oh, why could you just work on the beach? And I'm like, why would you be working on the beach? Why are you not looking to the, at the ocean? Right? To me, that doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Right? I don't want to be working on the beach. <laughs> yeah. Right? So what other yeah. people tell you is their idea of a lifestyle business may not be yours. So Mm -hmm. that very first step is, again, know thyself, 
right? What yeah. is it that you're trying to create and then build a business that way? Understand also it will not happen immediately. It takes time, energy, and focus. That's so right. that's all I wanted to add. <laughs> I, oh, I, I love, love that, that so much. I, I'm taking yeah. notes over here. So if you guys hear typing in the background, well, it's I, you know, taking notes. This is great. <laughs> On, just on that note, you know, in, in wrapping, um, I, I, as I ponder that and I will, I will re-listen, um, to this. It, it, I, I am a big believer in you can completely change your entire life and world in, in a decade and 10 years. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like a long time, but it's really not. And you can start at zero or even negative and get to, you know, a high net worth, passive income, mm-hmm. um, a lot of self-work bliss, spirituality, Mm -hmm. relationships, a lot can happen and change in a decade. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, you know, and I know it's a saying, we underestimate the year, but we, we overestimate the year, but we underestimate 10 years. Right. Mm -hmm. And so on, on that note, I think we, we close with a ton of lessons today on, on starting a value lace, sorry, I can't even talk a value based life with, mm. with defining bliss and what that means. And then backing into that and reverse engineering that with really all of your life decisions, including your, 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 uh, career and your investment portfolio. I've never mm-hmm. thought about linking the two, but, but it yeah. makes so much sense. You know, who do I want to work with? Who do I want to have as my business partners? Who yeah. do I want to spend time with? Well, let's back into that with, well, I'm going to buy executive homes and that's going to be my product. And that's going to be my real estate. It's really, really brilliant. Really, mm-hmm. really brilliant. So Monica, thank you so much. And, and, and we highly recommend your podcast and, and your book as well. And we'll put both of them into show notes. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Monica, thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. (laughs) Bye.